Dragon Ball Super Super Heroes English dub is out now in theaters and many of you have seen it. Today we have a very special guest. Joining me today, I'm very honored to have with me the star of the number one movie in the U.S., Dragon Ball Super Super Hero. He's lent his vocal talents to almost every major anime franchise in existence and many of the top video games in the business. The 2009 winner of the SPJA Award for Best English Voice Actor, and he probably should get it again after this movie. Please show your love and appreciation to Kyle A. Bear. Hello, sir. How you doing? Hey, that's an intro, man. Checks in the mail. Oh, no, it's doing great. <laughs> doing great, man. I'm on, I'm on cloud nine, Nimbus cloud nine, because, d dude, this is crazy. Having, you know, beating Idris Elba, beating Brad Pitt, beating, you know, Tom Cruise. What? <laughs> kind of. I mean, he, he's beating everybody this year, but this past two weeks have been insane you know what's crazy is dude i never thought in my entire life i would ever, ever interview the star of the number one movie in the country because when you think about that you think yeah. like tom hanks or robert downey jr but right now it's gohan it's it's crazy and you know i like to think of the film as an ensemble i mean if anything it's a piccolo and gohan kind of movie and and certainly you know the legacy characters coming together as a team which is which uh, doesn't seem to happen much, at least in the anime, where it's like, we're going to all watch on the sidelines while A squares off with B. But this time, everyone has to just give their, their 110%, and you see it all come together beautifully. So there, you know, there's a lot of great laughs, a lot of feels, and a lot of cheers. And you know, to see that and enjoy the theatrical experience, it's bar none the way to watch a Dragon Ball film. Not on your phone, not on a laptop, and maybe even a, a cutting edge 4K surround sound system as great and pretty and wonderful as that would be, it's not the same as being in a crowded theater, listening with fellow fans and watching and just having that, that vibe. Especially not with that big finale. It's funny too, because Ooh, when, yeah. when Broly came out, like all the Gohan, and I remember because I was around, all the Gohan fans were pissed because even though in Broly, Piccolo is in the film, he helps with Goku and the fusion, other actor, other characters are in there, Frieza, um, all these characters are there, there was literally no Gohan, not even a small, not even one line, and it pissed off a lot of people, and then this movie comes out, and it's like, well, now Goku, Vegeta, and Broly, who were the stars of the previous film, they're gonna be the sideline, they still have their scene, and we're gonna have Gohan and Piccolo take the lead, as well as 18 and Krillin and these other characters, and I thought that was... That that couldn't have been an accident. That one thing about modern Dragon Ball is that this thing is is really a it's a corporate machine. And that's for better or for worse. You know, they do research. Broly was brought back because of how popular he was. Gohan was made the main character because originally Toriyama wrote Piccolo to be the only star of this movie. And Akio was like, no, you need to put Gohan in because if you have two movies where he's not doing anything, it's gonna anger people and he did and that's well, how do you feel about that before we get into kind of the you know you as an actor how do you feel about how dragon ball now is more corporate because sometimes that could really be a problem like with star wars and other franchises it's not just one artist drawing a story or one writer we have a whole team now working together to see you know research marketing research and all that to see who's gonna how, how they can make the most money it 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 can be problematic because instead of a sole creator, it's suddenly about a committee and you can't just say, I'm going to do what I want. It's like, well, guess what? We're the bean counters. We have the money. So it becomes um, a partnership. And the thing that I think is on our side, whereas decades ago we didn't have social media, now people can get that instant pulse of what the fans are, are, are looking for, what they like, what they definitely what they don't like, because people are very vocal yeah. on that. And I think all companies are listening to that. And I, I think even if there was a long-term plan and Akira Toriyama said, yeah, eventually we'll get back to Gohan, but let's, let's focus on something else. I felt even after the Majin Buu thing from two decades ago mm. that eventually Gohan was going to come back. I kind of felt that he's such a big pivotal character in those those beginning arcs that it would just be silly to just have him just disappear. It's like, well, I'm going to go off and my mom says I should study, so I'm going to do that. I'm like, really? 
I mean, he's a full-fledged character. He's a great father. He's a great uh, husband. He's smart. Uh, and he's a, a goofball. He's a total nerd. So he, he's a well-rounded character. And obviously, if you get under his skin in just the right way, he certainly can prove to be powerful. And I think that, yeah, he could totally... I, he's poised to, if he just stays on it like like Piccolo says, he could surpass his dad and everybody else and just become the ultimate. I mean, according to Toriyama, he already did. He According to Toriyama, and it is controversial because, you know, all the fans always... It's controversial, but the series creator himself said that Gohan has surpassed Goku. Now... The film was written before the last two manga arcs, so obviously, as you know, it's going to be a push and pull because, you know, yeah. Gohan passed... In the Cell Saga, Gohan surpassed everybody, and then in the Buu arc, Vegeta surpassed Gohan, and then Goku surpassed yeah. Gohan, but then Gohan surpassed them all when he became Ultimate. Now, he then in, you know, the... Battle of Gods, Resurrection F stuff, you know, then Goku and Vegeta became the main players, and then Broly gets it, and then now Gohan again. So it's almost like a uh, like a relay race, and you have a different winner every few years. A cycle, a cyclical sort of uh, thing. It's like, let's give these guys the spotlight. Let's give this guy the spotlight. Yep. And in this case, with this movie, now we're going to get, you know, the, uh, the father figure and son sort of uh, dynamic, which has been a fan favorite all these years. And I think, again, um, they're they're listening. They're listening to what the fans have, what works with them, what they what they're uh, critical about, and all that, and finding a way for it to work uh, with with their story plans and the future, which is like we're gonna drop a new project and we're not gonna tell you what it is. It's like oh okay, well, I mean it's it's never gonna go away. Dragon Ball is such a giant franchise and has been for decades that and, and it's spawned fandoms in multiple generations now. It's going to it's going to last longer I think than than you or I on this planet. It's it's just going to continue. You're going to see Pan grow up and be a strong fighter and, you know, etc. Then you'll be playing the grandfather when she has a kid. And it goes there, on there you and go. On. Yeah. I have to use an old voice. <laughs> That's like a Roshi. Yeah. Roshi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well we're going to talk about your range shortly. I wanted to uh in the I don't know, are you aware and I'm assuming you are, but are you aware that Gohan Blanco, that is to say Gohan with white hair, was a meme in Latin America? They they created these characters, these fictional overpowered characters like El Hermano, who's Jiren's big brother, who wears blue. And then they created Gohan Blanco. They took a, an internet meme from, from Latin America and canonized it, for lack of a better term. That's such a, you know how weird that is? That is pretty strange. That's like when fanfic becomes, yeah, becomes canon. And like, what? What? <laughs> yeah, from Toriyama himself. Yeah, and you know, uh, when the movie first dropped, I guess in Japan, what they called him, Final Gohan, and then they changed it to Beast. Yeah, Final Gohan in the uh, in the script. Yeah. But then then they called it Gohan Beast, which, dude, just the name Gohan Beast is like such fan fiction like you know that's something that i would have come up with in high school you know what i mean yeah yeah it's like it suggests something very feral and primal and and all that and blanco i just when i hear that word it just reminds me of having queso blanco in the restaurant you know hell yeah no <laughs> mm, I'm, good stuff with the nachos let's go mm. back so um let's go back we're gonna i'm gonna go back here you worked at radio disney as a dj that surprised me yeah, because uh, I remember Kara Edwards, I think, worked there, too. Did you work with oh, yeah. her there? Yeah, yeah. I was a full-time DJ, and she was hired part-time at the time. And uh, she was there to kind of be a, a, what's called a phone screener, sit there and just decide who's going to get through to the DJ to put on the air. And uh, we realized quickly that we had a good on-air rapport, so we started doing a team show. And... Um, then she became full time and then come along the summer of 2000, our station co-workers hear about uh, open auditions then at was was then called Funimation. We went in, tried out and I got Gohan and eventually the narrator and she got Videl and, and Goten. And, but it's, it's, it's funny because she's so linked to you. Not yeah. just career wise, but like it's almost like a joke that she ends up playing your 
you're a fictional, your fictional yeah. wife and little yeah. brother. And yet you did, did when you guys auditioned, you know, in, in the early two thousands, was that, uh, who like, did one of y'all get in and then kind of recommend the other? Is that how it worked? No, actually, because the word got around the office, uh, a bunch of people on air and off behind the scenes as producers, they went in and all tried out. And most of them got hired to do smaller parts on various shows that Funimation did. Some small stuff on Yu Yu Hakusho or Blue Gender and, and whatnot. And for whatever reason, they didn't continue to use them, which is sad. But I mean, they're, they're all just a talented bunch that we had. We were like family. At, at Radio Disney, and it was one of my dreams ever since childhood to get on the air and do a whole theater of the mind thing, and that's what we were doing with kids' radio, sound effects, uh, music, and creating images that, you know, were, were, you know, in the case of me and Kara, we were on a spaceship, and I called it the Intergalactic Boombox, a name that I use to this day, now uh, d marking my podcast, which is all by myself, um, but I've, I've used that through the years, just an idea of a spaceship and and getting people to think beyond, oh, it's just a guy talking on a mic in a room, you know, just because I've always been fascinated by radio dramas and theater of the mind and learning about Mel Blanc voicing cartoons and voicing all those different characters and the fact that cartoons are recorded like a radio play with all the actors in the same room, whereas anime it's just one actor at a time because we have to match lip sync mm -hmm. and it just makes more sense money wise. Don't pay a, a bunch of actors to sit there and wait while one guy's trying to match his lip sync and, and hit all the lines. So uh, it's, it's been a wild ride for sure. It's it. So, okay. So I want to ask you about the radio Disney thing, but also going back to what you just said, the, so you always wanted to be a performer. Did you always want to be a specifically like a cartoon voice actor or was it because the DJing is like you're still behind a microphone you know it's kind of like you just did you always want to be behind a mic is that kind of the, the 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 I guess the the bottom the denominator here or whatever yeah I think I think because I was shy as a kid and introverted uh, I wanted to entertain but I didn't want people to necessarily look at me and that was a way around that you know? <laughs> Right. As a kid taking a cassette recorder and doing mock commercials and playing DJ with playing Kiss records on my turntable and introducing them and and listening to wacky parody songs from we uh, Weird Al and, and Dr. Demento show would play Monty Python skits right. and and funny things. It's like, wow, this this is funny. And it's something that I want to do someday. And it's been being able to knock out two bucket list dreams ever since childhood. First, getting on the air taking a broadcast degree, turning that into a job in radio, and then while I'm still on the air, pivot into voice acting and then do both for a while and then decide, okay, I got to walk away from radio. I got to pick up and move to the West Coast because that's where the cartoons are made. But yeah, animation was, was the key incentive for me. I wanted to do cartoons specifically. Yeah, and you've done a lot of them. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. I did want to ask you when you went to Disney. So you got a broadcasting degree, and then did you did you do like like some sort of like smaller, um, you know, tryout shows like locally? Like, we're, take me through the journey of you getting your degree and how you wound up getting hired at Radio Disney because that's like a this is a that's Disney dude. That's huge. <laughs> you know? It is. Uh, there used to be a network called Satellite Music Network, and they were syndicated nationwide formats. You had country, and then you had Top 40, and you had hard rock, heavy metal, and all this stuff. And those stations would beam by satellite years before XM and Sirius. And those satellite signals would, would uh, be subscription services to local AM and FM stations. So they would carry nationwide programming, but on a local level. And uh, they would hire local DJs and everything on that point. But um, I got an internship at that network, which eventually got bought by ABC Radio. And then Disney bought ABC. Yep. And then suddenly they had the idea, hey, let's try something new. Let's try kids radio. So here I am bumping through formats through the years, starting as an intern on Top 40 and a board operator, as in running the reel-to-reel the -reel tape of a DJ's voice tracks for big band shows. And then suddenly I'm on the air on a hard rock heavy metal station called Z-Rock. 
And that's where I first pretended I'm on the intergalactic boombox. And I just started doing a, a crazy, wacky Jim Carrey meets Robin Williams mashup of, of just goofy uh, voices and sound effects and, and just having a, bland, a grand old time. That went off the air. Radio Disney started and uh, I, I climbed on board as my first radio full time job. And we were doing theater of the mind, all sorts of acting. By the time I got to audition for Funimation, they're like, what acting experience do you have? And honestly, all the acting experience I had was just Radio Disney. We would do radio dramas. We would do character voices, pre-recorded bits with things. I would do a character called Aptitude Dude to teach kids about science. Well, man. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was a playground and it was so much fun. That was like your training, right? Kind yes. of in a way. Yeah. I consider it training. Most people come from the stage when when they become voice actors, they're already actors. I was an on-air DJ and a lot of on-air folks also kind of moonlight doing VO, but it tends to be commercial stuff which is very announcery like you know, Chevy, Ford, Starbucks, you know, mm. all that really announcery sort of thing and it's hard for them to break out of that announcery sort of mold which is why everyone tries to take classes and become the best actor they can, because it's not about the voice. It's about, you know, your range and everything. Yeah, no, and you're, I mean, dude, you you brought this, to, to specifically to, to Gohan, you brought this, like, teen heartthrob aspect to his character. You know, when you started voicing him, which is the Great Saiyan arc, um, you know, the early Majin Buu saga, he was, like, 18, you know, going to high school. Um, and it's interesting, because, like, you know, you... you you sound like like you're in your 20s. You know, you're able to like, I know not everybody can do that, you know, and that's all because of the Radio Disney, I guess, experience. Uh, I guess I was blessed with a with a youthful voice. Uh, and I, I, I look up to folks like Frank Welker, who are in their late 60s, early 70s, Legend. still voicing teenagers, you know, Freddie and Scooby-Doo. It's like, man, if I can pull off that, That'll be great. I'm 53 now and voicing, you know, Gohan, who's like half my age easily uh, on the new movie. And if I could pull that off. Yeah, I didn't have to pitch my voice up as much because the older he gets, the yes. more closer it gets to my own voice. People hear me talk. It's like, yeah, I totally hear that's Gohan. It's like, yep, he's in there. I didn't really have to do much stretch back then. Other than I added a layer of uh, rasp because Stephanie Nadolny voicing as Kid Gohan, Kid Goku, had that raspy quality, and I wanted to continue that. I thought it made sense for Gohan to still have that quality. And it's funny because, you know, when I, some of my most enjoyable moments watching the dub was when you had gone back in to do Kai, um, mm -hmm. the Kai Boo saga, the final chapters. Those early episodes, uh, and, and granted, there was a lot more filler in the Z version, and that's too bad because the, um, I actually prefer the Z version because the filler they came up with that was not in the manga for that arc specifically was so funny. I mean, just him having teddy bear underwear and all that stuff was <laughs> great stuff. Yeah, and it was all cut from Kai, but I loved all the classroom scenes and the baseball scene. Like, it was all, like, light slice of life stuff. I feel like, in your case, with other actors, they came into this thing screaming from day one. I feel like if you guys did it in order, which I don't know if you did. I guess you can fill me in on that. Um, you didn't have to scream until a few episodes in. That's true. And the recording process was a little bit different for me because I had already moved to L.A. in 2005. We were, we were banking episodes years before Kai got announced that it was even happening. So we kept that, on, we kept that mum for years. We were recording. I would have to fly out to Dallas and stay for the weekend and record just just banks of episodes. You know, if they had five scripts ready or 10 scripts ready, we just try to get it all out done, done, done long enough for me to be there and then fly back. And I think that was another reason that um, Doc Morgan took over as the narrator. Chris Sabat says, well, it doesn't make sense for you to financially fly out on your own dime every single week. To, to work as the narrator. And honestly, every every franchise or every piece of the story has its own narrator. Bryce Armstrong, then you, and then Andy Chandler on GT, and, and now Doc Morgan on, on on Kai and Super. Yeah, no, and it's, it's yeah, and that's interesting that they, they made that choice. You know, it's, it's yeah. he's, I mean, he's good at what he does. And, 
and so were you. The, uh, the, the funny thing about the Kai dub is the, the Boo saga, specifically the final chapters, that uh-huh. I know, and it's not a secret now, we could talk about it, that thing was done in like 2013, and it didn't even air until I think 2017, maybe early 2018. Yeah. And I'm just... It's on the shelf, yeah. And no, and it's funny because, like, I'm just looking at this, like, I know this exists. A lot of people on, on the inside knew it existed. Where is it? And then finally it came out. And now the big mystery now, the big, you know, um, I guess you can call it scavenger hunt in the fandom, is yeah. according to Brian Drummond, there is an ocean dub of Kai. They didn't do the final chapter. They did the original, you know, saying to, to, to sell. And nobody can find it. It's like gone. Like somebody in Canada has it somewhere and nobody can find it. And then people are worried it's never going to come out. Yeah. And I know it all comes down to legal issues, the contracts and and all that stuff. You know, just like the ocean version was out first in the United States. And then we got ahead, the Funimation dub. And then they slowly caught up with their cast doing it. And then we did Kai and I guess they did Kai, but it never came out. Yep. And, and then you did final chapters and that never came out. And there is no ocean of super. So, <laughs> Oh my God. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's it's, crazy. And you know, as, as I know that most fans do prefer the original Z to Kai, but I look at it a little bit differently because I feel that a lot of the cast is better, are, are better. Yeah. We're more seasoned. I agree. And, uh, the script is 100% faithful to the new Japanese script that they did for Kai. And I feel the performances are stronger. I still wince if I look at an old, early Gohan and DBZ stuff. It's like, wow, I'm so wooden. But, I mean, I was new. We were all mm. new back then. We, we all kind of cringe. But that's what the fans uh, were first exposed to. And it, it's a sentimental thing for them. Nostalgia. And, you know, nostalgia. Yeah, nostalgia. Yeah. It, it's a nostalgia bomb. And... You know, in, in any career you're at, you're going to start at the bottom and then you're going to get better at it. The more time you spend with a role, in the case of an actor, that thing's going to feel more fleshed out. So we felt like, and Chris Abbott said it best when we were doing Kai, it's like, you guys, the, you direct, direct yourself. This thing is autopilot. You guys know your characters so well that I don't really have to chime in unless, uh, you know, just for context. Yeah, no, and it's funny because um, I agree. I mean, I've said this a billion times. I know that Z has a lot of nostalgia for people, but Kai is the better dub, unquestionably, at least when it comes to dub. Obviously, mm-hmm. people have their preferences when it comes to music and, you know, because um, uh, in my opinion, I feel, you know, as weird as it may sound, the Japanese dub of Kai, in my opinion, is actually a little bit weaker than mm. the uh, original Z dub because I think those actors, you know, Nozawa's in her 80s now. She's still killing it, but it almost felt like, and I, I asked Rio Horikawa this at Command Con 1, it almost felt, I didn't try to disrespect him, but it almost felt like he sounded a little tired when he was doing Vegeta. And of course, as you know, every year you guys have to do new video games and you're doing the same lines over and over. Sean has done the, the Namek saga lines I don't know how many times throughout the year. Xenoverse, DBZ Kakarot. And like I feel like they were just kind of like, okay, let's do some new stuff. So when Super came around, those old actors had this new like invigorated energy and I feel like with Kai, based on my conversations with like Sabbath and Rager and everybody else, with when Kai came along, it was like your second chance to say, okay, now we're gonna tackle this the right way. That's kind of how yeah. I had always seen it. Yeah, it's such a rare thing, you know, because of tight production deadlines and in the case of shows that end up on Cartoon Network, a real tight production deadline. We, we get we do it and it's approved it's mixed it, and, and all that stuff and shipped off to, to air or stream and it is what it is and this was that rare opportunity to revisit that new material from a slightly different perspective with a different script and take these these legacy characters and revisit them it's like this this will probably never happen again well we're never going to have a a bleach Kai or a Naruto Kai or, or anything like that. I don't see it happening anyway. Well, Naruto has a lot of filler, so that one I think yeah. could happen. But it's but you're right. Yeah, it's it's so rare to like redo something. Like I know Sonny had told me um, when I did him a couple of years ago that he wants to redo the Bardock special because. The original Bardock special, I think it was his first time ever voicing Bardock, and he didn't like his performance. You know, you guys are always very critical of your own performances, which is 
I mean, you should. You're an artist. Um, but the script for that special was also just really bad. And I think a lot of the actors, as the years went by, wanted to be as accurate as possible. But the problem is, is as you said, they don't want to pay for it. Nobody wants to pay, you know, to do that over again. But Z Kai was the thing in Japan too. So that was. It's so rare. Let me ask you this. So Damian Clark yeah. played Future Gohan, the original Double the Trunk special. Why yeah. do you think instead of having him play adult Gohan, they recast it and auditioned it and that's how you got on board? Like, was it, it's technically the same person in the same body. So why do you think they, they went with, and I'm not saying that it was a bad choice, but why do you think that in that instance, they chose to recast uh, adult Gohan with you? That may be a more appropriate question to Chris Sabat because Chris is the one that, that ended up hiring me. I wasn't there until after the, the Future Trunks thing came out. Yeah, way on after. video. So, uh, plus Damien had already been a major character of Cell, right. and they probably didn't, they probably wanted to avoid, you know, one person having too many roles again, <laughs> like Chris voicing everybody. Yeah. I'm only guessing though. Uh, then I came along and I guess looking back now that we're in the world of multiverses, you could consider that a multiverse. It's, you know, <laughs> where you're seeing the different Spider-Men and the different actors and, and, and all that. So it's kind of like a multiverse before multiverse was a thing, I guess. So, so you're saying that it, do you think that maybe the ocean dub is like a multiverse of your dub like and Kai? Like that's a different way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of strange because. They can coexist. The only problem is it just becomes confusing because yeah. our dub aired in Canada and in the UK, but the ocean dub is originally what was, you know, meant for that. And all you can get on video, I think you can get the ocean dub on video up north in Canada, but down here it was a very limited, you know. They, they don't even, the ocean dub is only available on video for the first two seasons that were done by Funimation. All the right. extra stuff was never released. You can only get it by, you know, finding it on the internet. It's the only way to get those episodes, and they were taped off of television. So they don't, they didn't even release those on home video, and I think that's probably one of those, like, uh, corporate things, because I know for a fact that your dub, the Funimation Texas dub, I guess you can call it, that is available in Canada, but not the ocean on home video, and that's weird to me. Like, I can't that's imagine. It's confusing for some people. I mean, I get it because I know the backstory, but there's probably kids up there who have no idea what's going on. Oh, yeah, it's got to be confusing. And, you know, when they put out the Dragon Boxes, that would have been a great opportunity. And I know that Toye probably said, you know, we, no, we don't want to do that. It doesn't matter. But how cool would it be for uh, an English-speaking fan that watched the dubs, either in Canada or U.S., to have the complete box set with that option? Here's the I, ocean dub. I Here's know. this, you know. Well, there there is a fan project. You know, I, we don't talk too much about this, but there is an... There is a fan project where you can actually get both audio tracks on one file, but Ooh. that's... Yeah, that's not something that you can get legally. Uh, but <laughs> one of the... One of the things the fans did, though, that was really weird, though, is there's one, if, if you have, if they have an episode that, all the Saiyan Saga episodes, it switches between Brian Drummond and Chris Sabat, and it's so obvious, like, literally, because the Ocean dub was, like, cut up a lot. There was a lot of editing censorship. So it's weird, because you're listening to this, and you're hearing two different Vegetas in the same scene, and so that was, that, that would probably be more of a nightmare for them to edit, you know what I mean? As opposed to, like, yes. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So, um... Yeah. How did you, when you first came in to do Adult Gohan, did they have you, did they have you hear Damien's uh, future Gohan? And also, did they give you material like, okay, here's the first, you know, 199 episodes, learn everything you can about this character? Like, is that how no. they did it for you? No, no. The, the process is, is so forward going and quick. We got, we need it done yesterday kind of thing. That, uh, no, they, they never uh, played me any ref. I just went in and auditioned with what I thought Teen Gohan would sound like. And when a couple months passed and it was time to actually start that arc, they said, congrats. And, you know, the my training ground before I got to actually do Gohan was bit parts. Everyone that ends up with a bigger role or an episodic role starts with bit parts or walla just to make sure that you can be directed, that you know what you're doing, that you show up on time, and that you're a, a good, nice person, and you're professional. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I was able to do that. So the first thing I ever did was bit parts on the Bardock special. I didn't know that. 
I yeah. did not know that. So, so you were doing like side characters, basically background characters. Yeah, yeah and like Mr. Bourbon's gang after the Cell Saga. Uh, I was uh, King Furry was probably the first thing I wow. did on Z. I did not know that. I, I should have known that. I feel like that's a the King of the World kind of an important character in Dragon Ball. Did you go back and do that too? I believe so. Yeah. Once we once we started doing Dragon Ball. And then we, we kind of went back and said, okay, let's have the consistent cast and right. everything. Yeah, we did that. And I did a couple other characters at Dragon Ball, like uh, General uh, White. And right. <laughs> from the from Muscle Tower. There you go. Yeah. How, how'd you end up um, playing Ryu? How'd you end up with that role? Because, I mean, dude, when I was a kid, Street Fighter Two was the biggest game, early 90s. And you hear this guy, kid, you know, very Japanese. He's a Japanese guy. How did you end up with that role? Well, when Capcom decided it was time for Street Fighter 4 to come out, they wanted to have an English cast. And I had already been voicing various projects through New Generation uh, Pictures, the studio that did the dub for Street Fighters, uh, and uh, various animes like Helsing, Ergo Proxy, all sorts of different things. So I was on their audition list. Went in, tried out, and uh, basically saw a three-ring binder at the studio. They said, hey, just read whoever you want to read for. And everything had, had code names. And they said, if you're a gamer, you'll know what this is, but just just be cool. Just like, okay. I open it. And it's like, oh, I know what this is. And it had something yeah. like Bob. It was obviously Ryu. And then I'm reading for, oh, let me try for uh, M. Bison and uh, E. Honda and El Fuerte. That looks fun. I'll read for that. Why not? And Ken. And I just do my best in any audition and then put it out of my mind. And that's the, that's the best way to do it without driving yourself crazy because chances are you're not going to get hired. But um, luckily, uh, I was at a con in Taliesin Jaffe. Um, who was, uh, he, uh, he ended up directing that dub. He told me at a con that we were both at, so congrats, you got the big guy. Like, who, who, who are you talking about? Like, you got Ryu. Like, oh, I didn't know. Well, thanks for letting me know. It's like, okay, cool. And this is a year before it actually came out. So the localization of Japanese games, especially a AAA title like that, goes through various versions as the months go on and I have to come in and do pickup sessions and re-record dialogue or record new scenes as the cut scenes evolve and everything. And yeah, we're doing the dialogue first and then the the Hadouken and all the the wacky stuff, uh fight, you know, vocal cord strenuous stuff towards the end of the session. And we're also listening to the timing of the Japanese audio too. So no time for rehearsals like with anime and all that. You just go in. I'm a blank slate. Director catches you up and you're off and running. I mean, it's crazy because it's Street Fighter. That's the father of all fighting games in many ways, you know, and you're playing what I, what many consider the main character. I mean, some say it doesn't have a main character, but Ryu's like the Mickey Mouse of Capcom, you know. Well, not Capcom. It has to be Mega Man, but like of Street Fighter. He's the main character. He's the Goku of... Of, um, of, of Street Fighter. And if, cause earlier when I introduced you, you know, I mentioned that you had voiced on every major property and, you know, because I was looking at your resume, you've done Bleach, besides Dragon Ball, Bleach, Pokemon, Digimon, um, Gurren Lagann, you did uh, Ghost in the Shell, you've done um, uh, Naruto, Jojo, Mob Psycho, One Punch Man, Every you've been involved in every major mainstream anime. I look at a lot of actors; they have like you know a couple big ones and a few small ones because everybody does small ones. But you, yeah, and you have small ones too. But I mean, you're one of the few that have been able. Only a handful have been able to do Dragon Ball and Pokemon and Naruto and My Hero. So your voice can be heard. I feel like your voice. You're like the modern Scott McNeil. Like, your voice can be... <laughs> people will hear your voice every day. Every single day in a different show. And it, it's, that, it's That's a high compliment. So thank you very much for saying that because I thought Scott McNeil is like the Mel Blanc of Canada. So <laughs> Yeah. He's like the 80s, um, like the 80s icon. He's in so many things. And was yeah. all of these... Were all of these um, roles all because of Gohan? Like, or did you, was it a combination of like Gohan plus you had a good agent plus you were like, what do you think was the the key to, to getting in, involved in so many different um, projects and so many big ones, like huge shows? 
Well, unlike uh, like a corporate job where your resume and your experience is everything, it didn't really matter. It it it, it looks like it helps establish uh, like a pedigree with fans, but it's not like I could go into a studio and say, "Hey, I voice Gohan." You know, put me on your audition list. It's not like that at all. I would. Uh, you had to hustle. I, I got my. Yeah, you got to hustle, even with, with an agent. I got a great agent, but you got to network. You got to meet other actors who happen to work for studios, and that's worth its weight in gold if they're willing to walk your demo in for you because cold, cold uh, submissions don't normally work because the studio is busy trying to churn out the product. They don't have time to listen to a bunch of demos and, and cast new people and all that. So that, that, that door is pretty thin, that, that chance to kind of get in there. Uh, so honestly, you know, if they find out everything else, that's, that's gravy. But um, I go in, do the best I can with the audition. And uh, the more I work with the studio, the more that uh, they may start cold casting, which is great. You know, that doesn't happen with the big roles necessarily. It happened with Escanor on The Seven Deadly Sins, but I had recorded with Bang Zoom ever since 2005. They know my range, and they thought, you'd be a good fit for this character. So that was awesome. But in terms of everything else, I tried out for Ryu. I tried out for Gohan. tried out for Kamina and Gurren Lagan. I tried out for Aizen and Bleach, Kiba and Naruto, um, Fat Gum and My Hero. Uh, so many different things, and that's just par for the course. You audition, and chances are you're not going to get it. So if you book <laughs> one out of 100 things you try out for, you're doing good. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, yeah, if you if you apply at 50 jobs, you might only get four. If you apply at 100 jobs, you might get eight. That's kind of the mentality, the, the law of averages, right? Yeah, yeah, and it really is that whole cliche. It's who you know, not what you know, and... But if you get in that door, it's up to you to have the skills and the professionalism and juggling all those elements of what it takes to be successful to hope that that door will stay open for you, that you've planted a seed that will uh, blossom into something greater over the course of many years. Yeah. Now, I, I, speaking of many voices, I, was, I actually wanted to do this earlier, but I'm going to do it now and we'll do it again at the end. Um, can you go ahead and plug your Twitch and your podcast for those who may not know of it or maybe they, you know, give them the link and everything? Because you do you do funny voices on Twitch and you have a podcast where you also do that. So go ahead and plug that now. I have more questions, but I mean, I want everybody to take a mental note of that. Yeah, yeah, cool. I've been doing a lot of uh, nighttime directing of mobile games, so I used to stream every Tuesday. Now it's a little more sporadic, but when I do, I try to post on Twitter saying, heads up, I'm going to be streaming tonight on Twitch. My Twitch channel is Gohan with your bad self. So uh, that should be easy enough to remember. Uh, I usually would stream on a Tuesday night at like, uh, you know, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. But again, that's not every Tuesday. So follow at Kyle Abear on Twitter. My podcast is The Intergalactic Boombox, which I told you about earlier, right. my radio career and everything. It's basically me doing geek news, things that I love talking about, superheroes, sci-fi, horror, uh, tech, all sorts of stuff. But it's, you know, with the whole uh, uh, pretending that it's on a spaceship and I've got alien characters. I, I've made up a couple of stoner aliens. I've got a conspiracy theorist named Ken Spiracy. I've got a Karen who's just me doing a Valley Girl voice and it's pitched up and all sorts of wacky characters that I interact with in post-production. I kind of layer them together and all that. And it's about 15 minutes each week. Uh, every Friday is a new episode, the Intergalactic Boombox. And you can check out more info at boomboxpod.com. I will leave links in the description. Out of curiosity, have you ever considered taking that idea and turning it into like an animated short or something like that you know like that'd be kind of funny like an Ed, Ed, Eddie type of thing you know like wacky yeah. like that's something that'd be I mean you don't have to give it away if you don't want to but I feel like that's a good idea I think that would be amazing but I also think it would just be exhausting you know trying to launch an animated project and that's a whole different world it's like I know about doing VO and if I know animators or, or have an in with someone at Cartoon Network, it might be a different thing. But um, and if someone came to me and I don't see that happening, someone coming to me trying to pitch that as an idea and, you know, they've, they've got the resources available. I'm certainly open to it because I'm picturing 
characters and very animated scenes in my head. I'm yeah. playing them out as a radio drama on the podcast, just short little bits, you know, literally sketches and skits that are short. Like I stuck on a, a 10 second review of House of the Dragon. And it's just me going, I'm never going to pay attention to Westeros again. We were burned after uh, <laughs> Game of Thrones. And then I say, one hour later, after watching House of the Dragon, oh, my God, I need more. Oh, my gosh. I, uh, oh, look, Matt Smith is cosplaying Geralt. You know, you sound like Dragon Ball fans right now. <laughs> <laughs> I am never I, I can't believe it is to Goku. I'm never reading again till the next month. You know, dude, it's, dude, Dragon well, Ball, Star Wars, Immortal, wrestling. it doesn't matter what the fandom, everything. People are just like, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, but yet they keep throwing money at it. They keep going and yep. they keep watching, they keep listening, and they keep playing despite all the complaints. And who's winning? The, the franchise owners. Right. <laughs> well, can, can you compare video game voice acting to anime voice acting? I can compare it in that we have to record by ourselves for video games. The only time that we're not together is if we're in what call is what I call a walla group or a loop group where actors come in, multiple actors come in to voice background scenes like in a bar, or a restaurant, a city streets, that sort of thing. But uh, the characters themselves, uh, the scripts are, are, you know, in a giant Excel sheet and they're tabbed and everything and the lines can be uh, sequenced as one long story from beginning to end or just just the lines completely out of context and they're just in rows saying this is the mood this is the the type of voice we're looking for or the type of feel the emotion and, and all that and there's very little visual um things like the cut scenes if there's anything done at all it might be a rough animatic so it looks like a poorly crudely drawn comic book you know very static image but what we're doing is maybe listening to a scratch track or the original um Japanese audio, yeah, in the case of so many RPG games and certainly Street Fighter, we're listening to that and they're saying, okay, we know we don't have the finished animation, you can't match, match the lap fl lip flap, but you can match the timing. And some things, they'll, they'll even have the budget in the game to reanimate the mouth flaps to fit the English dialogue. So we'll do something very interesting at the beginning of the session in character voice will voice all the vowel sounds, A, E, I, O, U, and you sound like an idiot, but that is for animation reference. So they can sit there and do the sounds and oh, have that technology. It makes sense. Yeah. 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 I was, I actually, I'm going to ask you about that when we get to Superhero because there's a big, we're going to talk more about Superhero here in a minute, but okay, so, uh, with, but with, when you're doing video games though, um, let's say it's, it's, it's a project that like is, it doesn't require matching lip flaps and so like an original project is that easier because i feel like that would be easier you can just do whatever you want you know what i mean it is easier in that you know when you don't have the animatic stuff the japanese stuff is easier too um but it, it moves much faster if you don't have another language reference yeah. you know you're literally taking twice as long so just having a script in front of you and doing three takes of each line that's usually the protocol we're doing two or three takes of each line director picks a favorite or redirects faster, slower, higher, lower, whatever. More intense. And then move on down the page. Conversation, dialogue first, fight sound, shouty stuff at the end. And then you're also paid like several times as much, <laughs> even though it's easier. And anime is the redhead, redhead stepchild of voiceover. It pays so poorly, mm -hmm. yet it is the hardest to do. ADR, automated dialogue replacement. This is this is this process is done by live action actors all the time. They have to come in and loop or dub their own stuff on TV shows and movies because of helicopters flying and cell so cell phones going off. They only record on set just to have a basic reference. They very rarely use on set audio in the final mix. You know, one of the big secrets about the business that I found out recently, and when I say recently, I mean before I started doing this, I didn't have no idea. I found out like a few years ago, is when you have a big budget film, like a big movie, like a Marvel movie or something, what they'll oftentimes do is instead of bringing the actor, the original actor back, they'll find someone who sounds just like him. And that person will come in because the way it was explained to me was, let's say you're voicing over Robert Downey Jr. Well, Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man is going to be 300 bucks an hour. So instead of paying somebody that much money or more, sometimes more, these guys are huge stars, they'll bring in a, somebody to voice match. Um, but a lot of times, and maybe you can shed some light on this, a lot of times from what I understand, that person's not credited. 
it's almost like they do it. Is, is it still like that where, where they do sort of secret yeah. projects like that? It tends to be like that when the studio doesn't want you to know otherwise. Like Pat Fraley did all the uh, 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 for Buzz Lightyear. No one knew it. I mean, he might be listed as additional voices, but it doesn't say who. Oh, okay. uh, that's how they. Yeah, do it's it. kind of crazy, but yeah, Mick Winger does a dead-on Robert Downey Jr. and plays him in, in in Marvel's What If animated thing, but if he voiced any any stuff and came in to replace Robert Downey Jr. because he's off doing another movie, yeah, he's not going to get credited. He'll get uh, he'll get paid like a day rate, that's about a, a grand or so. And he's he's uh, because it's a union thing. You're eligible to make residuals. But in terms of seeing your name in the credits, no, not so much. So the loop group stuff, when the audiences come or the actors come into voice match, I did some on the second Alice in Wonderland. The Tim Burton? Matched, yeah. Really? Yeah, I matched the, the dog, uh, Bayard. I did a little puppy version of him that I hear my voice in the movie. I'm not credited. I did a voice match for the older actor that actually voiced Bayard in the film. Again, not credited, but I make residuals from it. So there's a record in the internal documents for these movie studios that know that, okay, these people came in and did voice work for us. We're gonna give them their residuals. That's what the contract calls for. But yeah, yeah, other than that. But that's, that's the thing when we say it's about voice acting, it's not about doing impressions. This is that rare instance we're yep. doing impressions, AKA voice matches. It's a super niche thing, but and, it does happen. And sometimes you, I mean, not sometimes, most of the time you cannot tell the difference, yo. Like you'd have right. to have such a, a trained ear, you know, and I don't even think, because they can always like take the voice and like play with it with you know editing tools to make it sound you know, pitching it. So they f- yeah. they figure out a way to make it sound like perfect. They have, and now with AI, this is a scary slippery slope. Oh, of- I know what you're going to talk about now. <laughs> Dude, yeah, yeah. If they can do this, and they've done this with Mark Hamill, you know, they they record him and then they stick him in a computer and tweak it and make him sound younger and and all that stuff, and uh, Val Kilmer on Top Gun Maverick, same sort of deal. That's with their open knowledge. But who's to say these companies aren't just going to record the actors once, store us in a computer bank, and then be able to reuse our voices in any way, you know, text-to-speech. But, you know, right now it sounds wooden and fake, and people can spot it a mile away. But technology gets better. Who's to say in five to ten years if people can tell? That's not Tom Cruise. That's a that's a robot. Like no, that's Tom Cruise. Like what, dude? I, there's a member of the Dragon Ball cast who called me talking about this, complaining, uh, uh, not in a bad way, but worried about the future. And I, I yeah, because 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 it's cool if you can like get like a Vincent, you know, a Vincent Price, like a modern Vincent Price, someone who's passed away. What's not cool is if you take, if you're going to be go, go cheap and record someone's voice, have a computer modulate everything because then it puts actors, you know, less maybe out of work, you know, maybe not, like you said, not in the next few years, maybe in 10, 20 years. And it's just, it's, 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 Technology, I mean, dude, when they started doing like the self checkout at the at Walmart, mm-hmm. like twenty years ago, I was already like, wait a minute, are they gonna put like Walmart workers out of work? Like, it's kind of scary when you think about it. Now we have self driving cars, yo. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, yeah, it's it's cool technology, but also scary. It's like I don't know what sort of job security do I have. I'm in the Screen Actors Guild Union, and there is a very conscious effort by, on the part of uh, a lot of actors that are like, we need to build clauses in the, in the future contracts that say, if you're going to lift our voice tracks to use an AI, we need to know what that's for. And, and we got to get paid. Piece of that. We yeah. got to get a piece of the buy. So, you know, and in the end, OK, I'm, I'm compensated fairly for something that I technically didn't voice. That's cool. That kind of did happen. That just reminded me. The second Wreck-It Ralph movie, Ralph Breaks the Internet, reusing the background, doing a sure you can, that was lifted from the original session from the first movie that I came in and did a cameo on. Wow. I didn't even work on it, but they paid me, 
and I get residuals for the second movie. It reminds me of when The Simpsons did, when, when Homer got that job as a voice actor playing Poochie, and they brought in the lady who voices uh, Roadrunner, and he's like, uh, she's like, meep, and he goes, you mean meep, meep? And she's like, no, I only record it once, and they double it, cheap bastards. She said that, and that, that was my first lesson as a kid, like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, they, they, they're, they're, they're screwing with me here, you know? That's so true. And, you know, there, there's a bunch of sad stories from the old classic animated days, the actors, the cast of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the classic claymation special. None of those people got paid beyond their session. No residuals, no nothing. It just ended sadly. And, and that's a, a, a movie that classic. comes out every year. That's, that's every, every year. year. <laughs> yeah. The studios are the only ones that make money on that, not, not the actors. I want to ask you about the, uh, yeah, and that's... That's a whole other thing. I want to ask you about the narrator. So yeah. Dale Kelly was the narrator on DBZ for a long time, and you replaced him. But what's yeah. odd is that on subsequent re-releases of DBZ, they took the time to have you voice over all of his lines, which they normally didn't do. What I find interesting is it wasn't like they like kept the broadcast like, you know, Toonami 1999 versions. On all the home videos, you went back and did everything. What was, do you know what happened with that? Like, what, what was the reason why he was even replaced? And, and do you have any idea? I actually don't. I knew that Chris Sabat, who directed pretty much all of Z, uh, told me that uh, we lost our narrator. You know, he's not going to be coming in anymore. I don't know what circumstances. Oh, it might have been like a personal thing. It might have been. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a multitude of reasons an actor doesn't return. It's not necessarily because they got fired or anything like that. They could decide, I just don't want to do it anymore, or I'm moving away, or I'm tired of not getting paid enough, or who knows. I right. actually never met, um, I never met Dale, um, and to this day I've never met uh, Doc Harris, the original narrator on on, on the Ocean Dub. He's he's but, amazing with that super deep voice oh, yeah. and the echo. Yeah, I used to imitate that, and then fast forward, I'm 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 doing that role, and I, I don't sound like him, and I don't think I sound like Dale Kelly either. But Chris was like, just try to get it as close as you can, and just make it your own. And then by the time Z had sold so many VHS and DVDs, they're like, all right, well, they're giving us the budget to go back and redub all the episodes with a consistent cast. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so if you have VHS or those initial DVDs, you can hear the original narrator and uh, original everybody. It's, I guess. it's interesting because I remember they released the they released the end of the cell games late. That was like the last DBZ DVD uh, before, you know, Kai and the Orange Bricks. And sure. I remember if you go from one DVD to the next, it literally switches from his voice to your voice. And it, oh. and I remember I was thinking, like, wait a minute, like, what happened? I mean, I didn't know. This was, like, years ago. I was like, what, what happened here? And, and I didn't assume the worst, but it was just, it's very different. I know that also Chris Sabat did go back to redo his early Namek Saga stuff because they tried to get him to sound like Drummond. And, you know, with the, the, the raspy Vegeta. And he... Tried to emulate that, but then when they got to the Android Saga, he kind of did his own Vegeta. So he, yeah. he he did go back to redo some of those, but not everybody did that. I feel like um, only a few people did. I think you and Chris uh, and maybe a couple others, but the original lines from Sean and Linda and everybody else are still there. Yeah, yeah. and uh, It's probably I a scheduling say, thing, you know? Yeah, I want to say the history of Trunks did get re-recorded and remastered and i think there was a little narration in there so i think i'm in there in that respect but not it, as gohan right chris was at a uh, a crossroads he says we could have you do that but i think we've already established damien in this particular role and it's like okay that's that's fine don't worry about it it happens. I mean, it, it's unfortunately the only consistency when it comes to this is oftentimes in the Japanese cast. And, and even that's bad because, you know, people have passed away. Uh, you know, th that cast is aging. You, you, the original three voices on Dragon Ball ever were the narrator, Bulma, and Goku. In the first episode, two of mm -hmm. them are gone. Goku's the only one still alive. And she's, oh, 80s, wow. eight, she's in her mid-80s, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, when the games came out, they were kind of in the same boat. It's like, uh, do we um, – oh, I had a train of thought. I just lost it. About, about, about the Damien thing with you doing Future Gohan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So on the games, Future Gohan, uh, 
Raleigh Pickens, who directed a lot of those games. He's he's Chris's right hand man, engineer with Ocratron. Um, he's like, yeah, we're going to keep you as, as, as future Gohan. It's like, okay, all right. I thought that would have been an interesting nod to have Damien still be that version of the character, but I'm not going to say no. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think also, you know, we talked about like how, like my generation, cause I'm, I'm in my thirties, you know, we grew up with, um, the, the, the original Z dub, but now we got kids who grew up watching Kai. There was a whole new generation of kids that grew up watching Kai. And so maybe it was one of those things where they were like, okay, well, this is now adult Gohan. It's you, basically, you know, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> or they watched it on the CW and Mr. Popo's Blue. Blue and, <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about superheroes. So how did you feel about Gohan being the lead? And how did you feel just as a you know, as a performer or, you know, as a fan or whichever about how Toriyama wrote the character this time around. Because I feel like the story with Gohan is he gets strong, he forgets that he has to train, and he's always being reminded, take it seriously, take it seriously. Now this time it's like, okay, you really got to take it seriously because Goku, I think the message of this movie, the message was... Goku and Vegeta are not always going to be there. They, they, the, who knows what they might be doing? And someone's got to protect the Earth. So how did you feel about that? As, as I mean, do you have an opinion? Yeah. Um, as a fan, I've been waiting for years since the, the Buu saga. As a professional, of course, I've been waiting for Gohan to, to have a, a moment to shine. And I love seeing the evolution and that connection that Piccolo and him have. Um, you know... I think it uh, people. I think it's kind of a misnomer to say, "Oh, this is Gohan's movie." I don't really think it's Gohan's movie. I think he's a he's a big part of it. I think Piccolo is a bigger part, and I think the whole story of the Red Ribbon Army and all that 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 just ties into all of it. So, I was a little a little let down that Gohan didn't have a bigger part, but the part that he had was so fun to play. And great that even that he's sending Piccolo off to pick up Pan and, and Piccolo's on a first name basis with the teacher. That's just hilarious. Or that Piccolo has to like screech, screech his finger on the window to get Gohan's attention. And he can't even fly the plane or he's like trashing the plane or whatever. He didn't know how yeah. to fly. Yeah, totally. It's like, wow, you have to. <laughs> the, the harsh critics are like. Oh, man. So you have to manipulate poor Gohan to get him to you have to hurt someone he loves or or make him think that someone's being hurt that he loves in order to light that fire and everything. It's like, well, whatever it takes. I mean, and dude, I but 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 that I've been saying that for years. It makes sense. I remember one of the common questions that we would get. And when I say we, I mean me, the other content creators is when is Gohan going to take his his shit seriously? And my response was always and I swear to God, since 2015, I've been saying this. Put Pan or Videl in danger and he'll take it seriously. And that's yes. exactly, it's almost like Toriyama like knew, I mean, he created the damn thing. It's like he knew, like, that's how you light a fire under him, yo. And then that final scene where it appears like Piccolo's dead, it makes me wonder, because I've seen the movie three times now, and yeah. now I'm, I'm actually wondering when Cell picked him up and he's like holding him up and he's like, Bleh! and then that's when Gohan transforms. We'll get to that in a minute. I wonder if Piccolo was kind of playing dead because a few minutes later you see Piccolo's arm stretching and grabbing Cell. I, I, part of me wonders, was he really not as hurt as he really... I mean, I know he was getting beat up. We saw blood in Dragon Ball for the first time ever since Super because there hasn't been any blood in the anime. What do you... Like, you know, like, like do you feel that could have been a situation, and it's your opinion, that maybe Piccolo was kind of overselling a little bit? Just an opinion, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, we saw a fight over the course of one movie instead of like 75 episodes. So he was getting you know, pummeled. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, would it have lasted longer in the show? Yeah. In, in actual chronological time, too. But um, yeah, kind of in my mind, that makes sense. I hadn't thought of it till you said it. It's like Piccolo wants Gohan so badly to, to do that, I, I don't see why he wouldn't. I mean, do you think at the after the end credits, you think Gohu, Goku really just kind of gave it to Vegeta, that no, Vegeta didn't just win? I do not. I do not think that. And I think, but you know what? Now that you've said it, 
how much you want to bet that now people, now the Goku fans are going to come on and say, oh, he, he let him win. He let him win. Because he chuckles, <laughs> right? He chuckles at the end. It's almost like, <laughs> I let you win. Yeah, it's but like, he always laughs at stuff like that. Like, he I don't does. Know. Yeah. He does. So, you know, it, it's all just fan conjecture. Uh, right. If, uh, if Akira Toriyama tomorrow came out and said, yeah, Piccolo was really dying, then fine. I can accept that. I can accept that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, me too. And, and as, as far as it being an arc, I mean, and that goes to my next question. This was a film unlike any other Dragon Ball film because it was done with this hybrid 3D, 2D um, style. I have a whole video on the channel discussing how they did it. Uh, it was called the Dragon Ball Super Animation uh, Explained, Animation Breakdown Explained. And they basically did a lot of CG mixed with 2D animation. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a new technology for Dragon Ball, really, for the whole movie. As an actor, one thing I notice about this movie is that the mouth flaps really match the Japanese. And I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think the Japanese may have pre-rolled this film. They may have recorded the audio first, and then they went in and kind of fixed the mouth. Was that more difficult for you guys to do your job, considering that they had to match it, you know, you know what I mean? The mouth with actual Japanese text. I didn't notice when I was dubbing that the mouth looked any different. It, it seemed like a 2D mouth to me, so it was either open or closed. It's totally different when you're dubbing live action because of the subtleties of the human mouth and the words that come out in different syllables and all that stuff, something that AI is going to correct too. Oh boy. That technology exists to where, yeah, you can totally dub something and the mouth will move to that language, which is amazing. But dubbing this animation didn't feel any different to me. And I know as controversial as it is, people say, oh, it's CG, it's terrible, blah, blah, blah. I thought it looked amazing. I thought it was yep. a, a good blend of, of both. I thought it would have been a mistake if they abandoned it and went full CG. That's a little too jarring. But, you know, you have these big panning vistas of the of the big set pieces and everything. And then when you get in, it, it, it looks back to something familiar. And that was a good call. I mean, dude, there's that scene near the end when they are all fighting Cell Max where uh, Kubota, the director, has this one camera spinning around Cell Max. And you've got Gotenks, uh, 18, Krillin, Gohan, Piccolo, and they're all fighting him from different sides, Gamma 1 and 2. And the camera's like spinning around him and we're seeing zoom in, zoom out. There's no way that they would have been able to do that without that tech. I feel like that. I mean, it would have taken forever, you know, old it would school. have. Yeah. If you want to hand draw that, that's going to be like a decade worth of work. And instead, you got a year or less with a whole team of animators granted. But yeah, that using that as a tool has opened up so many possibilities of what is visually possible now within these fights. Yeah. And also um, going back to what we're talking about with the with rules and arc. At some point, I wouldn't be surprised because they did this with Battle of Gods and Resurrection F. I would not be surprised if when the eventual anime returns, they take this film and cut it up into episodes like what they did with Battle of Gods, Resurrection F, and maybe even Broly as well. Then people are going to get to hear Johnny Young Bosch doing Broly. They're going to get to hear you doing more Gohan but with longer scenes. I think if they do that, I could be wrong, of course, then we might see it go back to traditional 2D like all the way through, in which case I think people are going to be more happy with that. I like the 3D myself. Uh, it was better than I thought it was going to be. I prefer 2D, but that's always yeah. a possibility. Yeah, I know everyone was pretty much iffy watching those initial trailers, but watching the whole thing in its true context, especially on the big screen, especially in uh, IMAX, it, it's just jaw-dropping. It's, it's beautiful. What did you think when you first saw Gohan Beast, his new form from the movie, and how wacky it looks? I mean, it's so... I said it in my review. It's fan fiction schlock, and yet somehow it works because Toriyama is... You know, I, I've studied Toriyama's other works besides Dragon Ball 2, and he, he's a very self-aware guy. He's a, com he's a comedian. He's a gag manga guy. What did you think about just his hair is ridiculous? Like, what did you... And red eyes and just... What did you the think? hair what? is ridiculous. It kind of reminded me of the hair metal look of Super Saiyan 3 on Goku. <laughs> Except like, spiked up. What was, spiked your, up. what was your first reaction to seeing that? I was, I was actually thrilled, just excited. It's like I've been waiting for so long and it's come to this moment. And I was like, whoa, 
whoa, this is this is cool. I thought the animation and the transformation is awesome. And I got to give him a a, a cooler uh, voice. The, the Super Saiyan 4 whisper kind of thing. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that was probably easier for your vocal cords too, because I was thinking to myself, because I watched the Japanese version, I'm like, okay, that Nozawa scream, because she's like a legendary screamer, you know. Um, and then I was like, man, Kyle's going to, he might break his throat doing this. But you, obviously you're a professional, but you know, I can imagine the, the low voice is easier than the high voice. I took, uh, it, it, did, it took more, more than one take. I will, I will say that, but I think by, you know, maybe three, I think the three at most, I was able to get it up to a high range where, I mean, cause I got a lower voice naturally. So if I go up too high, it cracks like puberty and it's like, then it's silly. So I got to find, I got to find something that feels comfortable to stay in, take the deepest breath you can and go for it. But yeah, just previewing that footage of the transformation the first time, seeing the eyes change and Oh yeah, it's just like, dude, this is this is great. This is awesome. Is that all you got? That was the line, you know. <laughs> is that all you've got? Now it's my turn. Yeah, now it's my turn. Awesome, man. That... I wish I had more dialogue. God, I wish I could have said more. Some people wanted that to be like a full out fight, but I think the idea is that Gohan is so much more powerful than Cell Max that it's just, you know, there's been a lot of debates because a lot of people I think misunderstand um, a, a lot of fans, they misunderstand um, Gohan and Cell back in Z because they think, well, you know, uh, Super Perfect Cell was stronger than Gohan. And that's not true. We have tons of evidence from the manga and anime that Gohan was leagues above Cell, but the reason why he didn't just kill him is because he was worried about the earth shattering. There's a line in the Japanese mm -hmm. version that was not in Z, but I think it was in Kai, where Goku's like, oh, I get it. You're scared of destroying the earth. Well, don't be. Let it all out. And I think in this case, it's similar to where Gohan is so far... I mean, dude, he got... There was a giant fist bigger than him, and it just... And, like, the, the, the area behind him explodes, and he doesn't even move. Yeah. Just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I love the psychedelic colors and the epileptic <laughs> fit. Oh, the oh it's with, so with the, awesome. the special beam cannon, the Makanko Sapo, right? I, I loved, because that because there was a scene in Broly where Gogeta and Broly are fighting, and they break the dimensional fabric, and it's all, like, weird colors. It's freaking awesome. And then they yeah. tried to, and I remember um, Sean told me, he's like, hey, if you go see this movie, man, um, if you have epilepsy... Or if you take acid, don't even, like, be, be careful. And then we see this scene where Cell Max has the green and black ball, and then Gohan has the, the red, the purple aura, the, the white hair, red eyes, and he fires the, the Makanko Sapo special beam cannon, and, it, and then when he bursts through the ball, it's like, it's like a, 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 a Pink Floyd type of thing. It was so, like, such a trip, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's it's really something. And if anyone listening to this right now is, is uh, hasn't seen it on the on the movie or if it makes you want to go see it again, go see it again and on the big screen. That's the only way that this makes the full impact. Uh, yeah, for sure. Let me ask you um, in your career. Like I said, you've done a lot. Is there a, a dream project that you have not done yet? It doesn't have to be anime. Is there is there like a certain like maybe company or or brand or a uh, show movie that you wish you could do that that's like your your current goal you know um, that you want to do I think a goal would be just getting just getting down the street I live down the street from Warner Brothers I would that is just I've seen it ever since childhood I want to work on a on a classic leg, like Warner Brothers cartoon or even a brand new character and I want to say I am the voice of that character or something I uh, I would love to be Eric Bauza. He gets to be Mel Blanc for Warner Brothers nowadays, and he's just killing it. He's so good. Uh, but yeah, something something Warner Brothers, something uh, Looney Tunes, something Batman, something Star Wars. But by doing a legacy character, you'll always be compared to oh, that's the problem. Everyone else. That's the downside. Of course, I would want to be Batman. I would I would never want to be compared to Kevin Conroy. There's no contest. Kevin Conroy is Batman. So 
personal so, wish fulfillment. Just just getting on a tentpole franchise like that and getting to voice animation that I get to record the voice for and not say, well, I'm the English voice for. I'm saying, no, I am the voice for. That's, yeah, and I always tell people, like, that is, I, like, people who ask me, I'm always like, that. that's a different, like, uh, um, like it's a different situation because, um, yeah, you're the only one, and you're going to be voicing it probably until you pass away, and they got to find somebody to replace you. Like, like how, there's been, like, what, six Fred Flintstones, five Winnie the Poohs, and usually it's because the actor passes away, you know? Yeah, there's multiple. The studio hires multiples to just, just kind of just wait in the wings. And if uh, they lose someone to death, retirement, or whatnot, then they can just move on up the line. Like, okay, who's next? Okay, Bob Bergen, you're Porky Pig. We got to have uh, two or three others behind him. Okay, <laughs> Eric Bauza, you're currently Bugs Bunny and these guys, but we're going to have to have some others ready. Uh, Billy West, you've been him in Space Jam, so you're also a backup a Bugs. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's. It, I was just curious because, you know, there's – You've done a lot. I mean, like I said, you've done everything when it comes to like um, uh, anime, every big, big franchise. Like uh, some people are still like wanting to do Pokemon, wanting to do Dragon Ball. I have friends of mine who w would love to do Dragon Ball. Like that's like they grew up with it. You know, you have all these actors nowadays. It's funny because you have these actors that are coming up. Uh, teens or 20s or maybe even early 30s who grew up with, with listening to you and your your um, uh, your peers and they're just fans and then I feel like the previous generation like the one before you they were fans of other stuff like I like I, you know like how a lot of the actors are fans of like Star Trek and like things that were out back in the day you know and a lot of these guys are kind of like old school it's almost like old school wrestlers how they uh they treated the wrestling business like a job but I feel like now we've got this sort of hybrid where you have people that are fans who be eventually get the job and that's okay too um I was going to ask you what are you a fan of like out of these things that we have discussed what are you like really hardcore about uh well nowadays it's um it's all sorts of uh things being a star wars fan lifelong i love the mcu i i'm worried that it's getting a little watered down with too many tv series spinoffs and all that but i'll yep. still watch them just like any other hardcore fan that complains about it they'll still be there day one Watching, you know, the good, the bad, the indifferent, the mediocre, and and whatnot. But um, Dragon Ball, I started as a fan, and then I got to work on it, and it's meant so much to me professionally. It launched my career, but as a fan who's been following it all, I'm excited to see where it goes. Even though I don't have enough hours in the day to actually watch every episode and and do all that, I kind of have to either read Wikipedia or ask the fans, "It's like what's going on in the show?" Because I want to know. I mean, they have purposely kept, in the manga that is, they've pur purposely kept Gohan and Piccolo out of a lot of the stuff, uh, probably because they knew this movie was coming, you know, yeah. um, so that's, you know, but that doesn't mean they're not going to come back, because I think that this film, with Orange Piccolo and with Gohan Beast, this was done to get these guys on the same level as Goku Vegeta, because should there be another tournament of power you've now got a lot more power. And I feel like if, if, and this is just me as a fan talking, if this team now was in the T.O.P., they would demolish everyone. Even if it was just Gohan, Piccolo, Goku, Vegeta, and Broly, just those five, not even including all the other characters, just those five would probably dominate right now. So they've elevated yeah. the scale so high that it's just, and I remember thinking to myself, okay, there's no way Gohan will ever surpass Goku again because... We've got Ultra Instinct. You've got all this angel tier stuff. And then Toriyama. And granted, you know, some have said it is lazy writing. And I understand that. He just wrote it in. And you, I mean, you could get mad at it, but he is the creator. What are you going to do? You know? Mm hmm. Weird. Exactly. So, and I don't know, I, you know, because he's so secretive and private, I wonder if he's, he's kind of kind of secretly lurked in forums and, and scrolled through social media to see what the vibe is on Piccolo or Gohan and whatnot. And maybe that helps shape where the franchise is going. Wouldn't I, that be cool? I just, <laughs> I just don't want him to read Twitter. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> he can do anything. Just please don't read Twitter. Well, the good news is that Akio did say, and I'm not sure if, if you 
heard about this or if you, you're even told, I know you're busy. Akio did say they're already pre-producing the next film. So there will be another film and there's rumors of an anime return that's been going on for a while now. So, but we know for sure from his own words, he's the, he's the top guy that there will be another movie. Hopefully, we'll see cool. everybody in that one. So before oh, we close out, man, go ahead and plug all your stuff one more time, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, man. I'm on Twitter and Instagram, at Kyle Abair. I'm on TikTok, at Kyle Abair VO. I'm on a podcast that I host all by myself called the Intergalactic Boombox. Check it out. It's funny. At least I hope so. Uh, boomboxpod.com check it out there other than that go see Dragon Ball Super Superhero as many times as you can in the theater and send that message to Hollywood that anime is here to stay I think that message needs to be sent to Hollywood and to Japan because dude the fact that anime films only get like two week three week releases sometimes even days is such BS man like we this is not like this is not like, you know, the 80s anymore or even like the, the like, dude, Pokemon like 99 had a full theatrical release. Broly had closer to it. This one, they're already pulling this from some theaters and I just feel like it does a disservice to anime because, I don't know, man, I always feel like, like you said, it doesn't get as much promotion as it should. Like, it, I feel like this, this franchise, especially Dragon Ball, can be up there with the MCU. Maybe not make as much money, but be more mainstream than it is. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what else they could do except really push it, you know? Yeah, and I hope they do. Uh, I, I'm really, really proud to be a part of the franchise, a part of this film, a part of the fandom. And, uh, yeah, I think no matter where it goes, it's still, that popularity is not going to wane by, by any means, regardless of what theaters or studios do to kind of gimp it or whatnot because they, oh, it's just anime or whatnot. Uh, the fans are the true voice, the pulse of the people. That's who you see at the conventions. That's who you see very vocally online. And it's funny because I, I see these reviewers and they say things like, well, you know, for an anime film, it did well. And I'm always thinking to myself, you know, that's nice and all, but how about we just eliminate that and just say for a film, it did, it does well and actually put it up there with like your Pixar's and your, you know, movies that are for all ages for the family. I would say this one's a, it's a, it's a little bit more for the older crowd because there's blood in it. I wouldn't, I mean, it's not that bad, but you know, I, I kind of hope that one day during our lifetime, do we get an era where anime is taken really seriously by the mainstream? I think it, it's a niche. It's not as niche as it used to be, but I think it could still be bigger. There's still room for growth. Yeah. Well, if it ever pays what everything else does, it'll certainly get more respect, at least within the acting community. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's hope so. But thank uh, you. Thank you again, Kyle, man. I really appreciate you stopping by and talking to me about your career and this movie. And I hope that everybody, I mean, the performances, I, I tell everybody, there's not going to be a bad Funimation dub nowadays of this franchise anymore. Uh, the, the, the days of like, you know, cheaper equipment you know that we're done with that like everything there's been especially with with sony now like they're they're not going to put out a subpar product um so i thank you guys for what you've done and i congratulate you on the success of the film and i hope that uh you know look out for kyle abear coming to a con near you get your gohan stuff signed because let me tell you all this is a fact we have n they have not released gohan beast action figures and statues yet that's coming in the next year so you'll be signing a lot of those i'm sure i hope i hope so too man i'm looking forward to it thank you for the support we couldn't do it without the fans and we certainly couldn't do it without toye shueisha everybody the staff over there and of course akira toriyama so i'm so grateful to everyone and the universe for uh this wonderful opportunity I will leave links down below for Kyle's Twitch as well as his um, uh, podcast. Thank you again and take care. We'll talk to you all in the future.